Um, I'll open this with a prayer this morning. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for this opportunity that you've given us to come together in fellowship one with another and to fellowship in your word. Uh, we ask that your spirit open our minds and our hearts to the things that we'll see this morning, <clears throat> that they might become a source of blessing and challenge, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> um, let me get my view straightened out here. There we go. <clears throat> All right. There's a number of things have happened lately that have uh, motivated me to spend some time on this subject of eternal security. <clears throat> and it boils down to this question, is the believer forever secure in Christ once he is born again? Um, are there any circumstances whatsoever by which a saved child of God can ever lose his salvation and return to an unsafe status and the condemnation to hell that is associated with that? <clears throat> my short answer to that is no. But not everyone agrees with my short answer. Obviously, there are um, some that take a doctrinal position that does claim that it's possible to be saved by faith and then through some act or series of acts forfeit your salvation thus the need for this study <clears throat> i'm going to be working under the premise that the person in view here is indeed a born-again believer on the basis that salvation is appropriated by faith through grace ephesians 2 8 and 9 <clears throat> and it is a gift to those who trust the work of Christ on the cross that the work of Christ on the cross has dealt with his sins. The scriptures clearly teach there's no other process by which one may find reconciliation, reconciliation with God other than by placing one's trust completely in the hands of Christ and what he did on the cross. That means not Allah, or Buddha, or Confucius, or anyone else can save you, including you yourself. Only Christ can save you by grace through you placing faith in what he did on the cross. This study will focus on the possibility of, or not, of reversing that. The doctrine we will deal with is sometimes called once saved, always saved. I don't particularly like that term. Uh, some say OSAS. I prefer a more positive and doctrinal eternal security to describe it. Many arguments are presented to dispute this position. And during the course of this series, I will attempt to deal with those passages that are most commonly cited as proof text evidence that you can lose your salvation. We need to do some background work to develop um, how we look at scripture. One of the first things we need to look at <clears throat> is exactly how do we study the Bible. <clears throat> Studying the Bible is easy, and then at the same time, it isn't. We can get a lot out of just reading the Bible and meditating on what we read. But like reading any book, if we read just a random sentence, in the middle somewhere, or some random paragraph, or even a whole chapter, we are reading it out of the context of the whole story. No matter how well we think we understand what that sentence says, it never tells us enough to understand the whole story. And if we don't understand the rest of the story, how can we understand the sentence? The Bible is the same way. It's very easy to pick a passage out of the Bible and arrive at a determination about what it is saying, which it may be right or it may be totally wrong. It's often very easy to take a passage out of context and make it say whatever you want it to say. Or as the saying goes, a passage taken out of context is a pretext. 
you do not pop out of your mother's room, womb with even a basic knowledge of, re in, of language and reading skills, much less understanding more complicated subjects like mathematics and history. The same is true with your new birth and the Bible. We're not born again with a broad and deep understanding of the many doctrines in the Bible for living the life we are called to live as Christians. New believers are babes in Christ and are capable of taking in only milk, which means the simplest of those many doctrines. Like a child, we must go through an education process to advance the spiritual maturity where we can have a fully and properly functioning spiritual life. Romans 12, 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as the living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This passage is an appeal for Christians to live a life glorifying to God. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. It is an appeal. The Greek means to beseech or exhort, implying it is entirely possible that such a life that is a living sacrifice is a potential and not a guaranteed reality. As this passage states, we're called to a complete renewing of our thinking. The word in the original language is one which, from which we get the English metamorphosis, much like the transformation the caterpillar goes through to emerge as a beautiful butterfly. While the new birth is a one-time event, the growth to spiritual maturity that follows takes place over time. And it is not guaranteed that a believer will pursue that goal diligently. Just like as a child, you need to learn, grow, and mature into a functioning adult, so does the babe in Christ. First, we take in milk doctrines. But as we grow spiritually, eventually we can take in the meat, which is where the more complicated doctrines are found in the Bible. That growth process does not happen overnight. It could take years of study. And even then, there will always be more to learn. I've looked at some passages dozens of times. And each time I look at it, sometimes I see something that I hadn't noticed before. Yeah. Unfortunately, far too many churches today teach only milk. And their members never really mature spiritually. Hebrews 5.12. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child, but solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. This passage in Hebrews speaks of what we've been talking about. The writer of the epistle is charging the recipients with the fact that they have not advanced spiritually. By this time in their spiritual development, they ought to be teachers, but they are in need of teaching. They need milk because they're unskilled solid foods for the mature, which gives the mature believer the ability to distinguish good from evil. Obviously, not all believers are capable of distinguishing good from evil, and they may not exhibit the fact that they are born again. These Hebrew believers have not advanced to spiritual maturity, and the fact that the author is charging them with that failure is proof that they have been 
believers for some considerable length of time that should have been more than sufficient for them to become spiritually mature. It's absolutely critical for the new believer to get off on the right foot and learn sound doctrine and to continue that growth process. And no doctrine could be more basic and more important than the doctrines of the soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. Get that wrong here, and that will lead to much error later. All through that learning process, there are many opportunities for Satan to mislead the believer. Many of the epistles in the New Testament deal with this very problem of false doctrines creeping into the church, especially false doctrines relating to salvation and the spiritual life. Nothing's changed in 2,000 years. Satan is still trying to distract believers from the truth. There's a big red target on every believer's back. The Bible is a complicated book. But if you approach it right, it's actually very easy to grasp the many nuanced details found in his passages. To accomplish this, there are certain rules of hermeneutics the student should follow. And the first one, context. <clears throat> like they say about buying and selling a property, the three most important things are location, location, location. <clears throat> With studying scripture, the three most important things are context, context, context. Failing to consider the context is probably the biggest reason we get bad interpretations of scripture. In preparing this study, <clears throat> I found that just about every proof text that supposedly says you could lose your salvation was interpreted wrong because of an easily avoided context issue. Well, what do I mean by context? <clears throat> Context is the background that surrounds a study passage. Uh, I put it this way. It's the forest in which we see the bird on the branch of one tree. A given passage may actually have several contexts that are important to its interpretation. Some to consider. Who's speaking? To whom is he speaking? And when is he speaking? For example, look at Matthew 12, 31, 32. Jesus is speaking to Israel through the Pharisees who have accused him of performing miracles. Oh, I, missed, I didn't include the passage. <laughs> so Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees early in his ministry uh, in the context, and he's saying likely only what he is saying is likely only relevant to them and or Israel because at the time of his ministry, everything he's, is, was about Israel and accepting him as the Messiah King, offering Israel their promised kingdom. Relevance to the church may not exist at all, or if it does, it must be viewed through what I call Israel colored glasses. In this situation, make application to Israel, then determine if it has any application, direct or indirect, to the church and to what extent. You'll have to go look at the passage to see what I'm talking about there. <clears throat> the Pharisees were saying, well, accusing Jesus of performing miracles in the name of uh, Beelzebub and rejecting Jesus as Messiah. Another, what is the immediate subject context of a passage? All right, what caused the speaker to say whatever he said? What is the broader subject? If the broad subject is about the spiritual life, then the subject passage probably <clears throat> needs to be understood in that context. You may have to go back to the beginning of the chapter or even to the beginning of the book and or go forward to passages after the subject passage that may be relevant to its understanding. The classic example of this issue is the epistle of the Hebrews. It is absolutely essential to understand the whole context of the epistle to correctly interpret any passage in it. 
Because of failure to do this, Hebrews is one of the most misunderstood books in the Bible. What's the historical context? The serious expositor needs to understand the historical events going on at the time of the passage under study. They can often impact the interpretation. What's the cultural context? The Bible spans thousands of years and culture changed many times during that period. Some cultural mores were driven by the culture itself and some were God given either by direct communication or through the Mosaic Covenant during the Age of Israel. An example of this is throughout the Age of Israel and even beyond in the Middle East, it was a set process for arranging marriages. Jesus alludes to this practice in several places in the Gospels. Understanding that cultural marriage process helps to correctly interpret certain passages relating to the end times. Categorize into correct doctrinal context. Categorize the passage as to its direct, uh, as to its doctrinal subject and interpret in the context of that doctrine. Always, always reason from what is known and established as true to the unknown never turn this process around. What I mean is to identify the subject of the study passage and compare it to already established as true interpretations of passages on the same subject. If the study, study passage seems in conflict with already established as true doctrine in other passages, the student is compelled to consider that his subject categorization and thus interpretation of the study passage is wrong. Never automatically assume that just because the study passage seems to conflict with already established doctrine in other passages that the other passages must be wrong. It is possible they are, but you should never jump to that conclusion on the basis of one passage. Positional sanctification, experiential sanctification, or ultimate sanctification, otherwise known as saved in three tenses. This is really a subset of the doctrinal context failure. Most errors of interpretation regarding our subject of eternal security are directly a result of looking at a passage that is about experiential sanctification and making a positional sanctification application. All right, what do I mean by these big fancy terms? Positional sanctification. This is your identification with Christ as a born again believer and is most often seen in scripture in the term in Christ or some variation of that. It refers to the believer's salvation. This is also called saved in the past tense, meaning the believer has been delivered, saved from the fires of hell and the penalty of sin. This is a one-time event and does not depend on experiential sanctification as any assurance of proof of its existence. All right, what's experiential sanctification? This is the believer's spiritual life or discipleship or Christian walk or spiritual growth to maturity, whatever you prefer. Like salvation, it is supernatural in that it is a life of grace lived by faith and produced by the indwelling Holy Spirit in those who walk by means of the Spirit. That's from Galatians 5.16, one of my favorite passages in, passages in the Bible. Another term for it is eternal life, in the sense that it is lived in the here and now, not just in eternity. Well and properly lived, eternal, eternal life looks like Galatians 5, 22 and 23, because it is the very life that Christ lived here on earth. This is what will be evaluation, evaluated at the Bema judgment, nothing else. This is what can be lost through sin. 
the grace that you can fall from, the life that you can stray from, the faith that you can abandon, and whatever you can reject to its utter destruction, meaning physical, temporal destruction. This is also called saved in the present tense, meaning to be delivered or saved through life's trials and tribulations and from the power of sin by the grace of God. Ultimate sanctification, also called glorification. This is the believer being delivered into glory at death or the rapture, whichever comes first. It is being delivered or saved from this body of corruption into one that is incorruptible and ushered into the presence of God forever. This is sometimes called saved in the future tense, in the sense that it is yet future and a certainty as a result of our positional sanctification. Experiential sanctification has nothing to do with this ultimate sanctification with one exception. And that exception is the glorified believer will face the bema judgment to have his spiritual life, his experiential sanctification, evaluated for the purpose of receiving rewards in heaven or not. Sin is not an issue at the bema judgment. Only the believer's spiritual walk and his fruit production are evaluated for potential rewards or crowns or not in heaven. 1 Corinthians 3.10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if Anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. Each one's work will be manifest. For the day will disclose it. It's because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved as though through fire. This is the bame of judgment. Only church age believers will be present. Sin will not be judged there because that was already judged at the cross. What is evaluated or judged is our spiritual production. What did we do with the spiritual gift or gifts? and the assets that we were given by God to accomplish whatever we are called to accomplish for the glory of God. Works built on a solid foundation, the leading and empowerment of the spirit, are gold and silver and precious stones that survive the fire test. Works that are produced in the power of the flesh or for, for, for personal glorification of wood, hay, and straw, which will burn as useless and when tested by fire. What is at stake is not our salvation, but the receiving of the loss or loss of rewards in heaven. I made this little diagram for you, saved in three tenses. And I got it from someone else. Um, and he compares them, the three tenses this way. We have positional sanctification, experiential and ultimate sanctification across the top. And down below, we have some um, descriptions of how it works. Positional sanctification, we can see it's in the past tense. It happened. It's history. Experiential sanctification is the present tense. It's ongoing. And ultimate sanctification is in the future tense. We're looking forward to this glorification. In positional sanctification, we are saved from the penalty of sin. In experiential sanctification, we're delivered from the power of sin. In ultimate sanctification, we are delivered from the sin's presence. We have no more sin nature. nature. We're in the presence of God. And there are scriptures you can go look up to see what I'm referring to here. Remember these three tenses of save. We'll see more examples of this later in our study. 
Lastly. <clears throat> One is forced to consider the original language, be it Hebrew or Greek. Some words just don't make the jump from one language to another very well. Also, the translation is dependent on the skill of the translator and his objective for the translation. Today, we have multitudes of translations ranging from those that are called formal translations to those who are called dynamic or functional translations. The formal translations attempt a more strict word for word movement from the Greek or Hebrew to English. And the functional translations work more from a thought for thought translation. A word for word translation could be seen in the New King James Version or the New American Standard Bible. While the contemporary English version and uh, Peterson's The Message is a functional translation, also referred to as paraphrase. The formal translations attempt to remain true to the syntax of the original as possible. The sentence structure might have made perfect sense to the first century Hebrew or Greek, but it can create some really strange sounding sentences in the English. Furthermore, Words can be translated correctly, but lose some of their meaning during the translation. A good example is the English word if. In Greek, there are four different words with four different meanings that are translated if in the English, unless the immediate passage context suggests, gives you a hint, and it often does not, you don't get that difference by just reading the English if in the Bible. And it could be significant to understanding the passage. The differences are called conditions and they're given a class to differentiate them. We have if in the first class condition, condition in the Greek means if and it's true. This sometimes can be translated since. In the second class condition, condition, it will mean if and it's not true. And then we have the third class condition is if maybe it's true and maybe it isn't true. And the fourth class condition is really strange. It says if and I wish it were true, but it isn't true. All four translate simply as if. Colossians 1.23. Indeed, you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from hope of the gospel that you heard. That in, if indeed is in the first class condition and considered to be true. It is not maybe they will or won't continue in the faith. There's no doubt that they will continue in the faith. The easiest and most common mistake in interpreting scripture is to fail to consider the context. Do that and we get bad doctrine. All right, let's define a few terms and we will, we'll define a few more as we get into this. <coughs> Grace. Now, before we do that, anybody have any questions? <laughs> okay, move right along. Grace. We have already defined grace as something received unearned and undeserved. The recipient of grace does not pay for it in any way. There's no quid quo pro in the usual sense of such. We're going to be looking at the kingdom. And while this is only a very brief description, um, I could develop it much more later if we we're interested. The kingdom comes with several names and at least two forms. The names include the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the messianic kingdom, and just the kingdom. The kingdom comes in two forms. One is a physical and literal kingdom, and the other is a spiritual form of the kingdom. The two are related, and in some cases coterminous, but sometimes only the spiritual aspects of the kingdom are in view in a passage. 
Matthew 4, 17. For that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Which kingdom is in view here? If you say the eternal spiritual kingdom, you would be half right. Jesus is speaking to Israel, context, about things relating to Israel. He's speaking of the literal, physical kingdom that was promised to Israel. But Israel rejected the king, and thus the literal, physical kingdom was not really at hand or near, is what the term means. So was Jesus wrong? No. Because Jesus was also speaking of the spiritual kingdom. And that was indeed near and given to the church at Pentecost and ignore the spelling. Romans 14, 7. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and grace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Which kingdom is this? This was spoken during the church age by Paul. Context. And it describes the spiritual kingdom that was and still is in effect. Peace and joy sound like maybe the fruit of the spirit. It should, because that's exactly what is referring to. The spiritual kingdom is seen during the church age in the form of the believer's spiritual walk with God in the power and leading of the Holy Spirit. The nine attributes seen in Galatians 5, 22, and 23 are not only a picture of the very life that Christ lived while here on earth, but also a picture of the spiritual characteristics of the kingdom that believers can experience now and will experience fully in glorification. The physical literal kingdom can be seen as the millennium and eternity that follows. But in both literal and physical, it is both literal and physical, with a literal king reigning in Jerusalem and includes all of the spiritual aspects associated with the king. We would say the kingdom refers to any type of rulership God may assert on earth at any given time in human history. Prophetically, it's the millennium and eternity. However, the parables in Matthew 13 represent the kingdom of heaven in its mystery form during the church age. It is the dynamic power of God's rule on earth and is the impact of the believers who execute the plan of God for their lives. We have this word apostasy. The word means a public denial of previously held religious belief and is a distancing and a distancing from the community that holds to it. The term is almost always applied a pejorative carrying connotations of rebellion and betrayal and treachery of faithlessness. It is seen in scripture using several different terms such as falling from grace, falling away, led away, hardened, entangled again, and straying, to name a few of the many such terms used to describe a believer in a state of apostasy. The word apostasy means to deviate from the truth and does not imply the losing of one's salvation. We'll see more on that in this study. Law and grace. One of the biggest issues we have in properly interpreting the word is failure to separate Israel and the church. God has a plan for each, and they only rarely intersect. The failure, this failure, is the chief reason for the false doctrine that's called replacement theology, which teaches that the church has replaced Israel in God's plan. But that's a study for another time. There's a chart coming up, is an attempt to show the differences between Israel and the law versus church and the grace. Understanding the differences help in interpreting some confusing passages we'll look at later. All right, let's look at that chart. The two headings on the left, we have Israel and the law, and we have 
church and grace. And we on the left, we have different attributes and we're gonna see how they are similar or different. Regarding salvation, under the law, salvation is by faith apart from works. It is a looking forward to what would happen at the cross. And that's to the extent its details were revealed to the Old Testament believer. <clears throat> and not all details were believed, uh, were um, revealed. There was a progressive revelation. Salvation is neither earned nor is it deserved. Faith is man's only contribution to the process. All right, let's swing over to the church side of salvation. It's by faith apart from works, just like before. Looking back at what was accomplished at the cross rather than looking forward. Salvation is neither earned nor deserved, just like under Israel and under the Old Testament. Faith is man's only contribution to the process. All right, so basically, and oversimplified is in the Old Testament, the Old Testament believer was saved by faith, looking forward to what was promised. And that promise was the cross. Now, he may not have had all the details that we have, but he looked forward in faith to what God had promised to do. To do. With the church, we look back at the cross and everything that God promised and did at the cross. So oversimplified, we say the Old Testament believer looks forward to the cross. The New Testament believer looked back at the cross and both are saved by faith apart from works. All right. What about the temple? Under the age of Israel, the temple was in Jerusalem. And a believing Jew met God at the temple. A formal relationship with God was conducted only at the temple. And it was conducted through a priest and a mediator. In the church age, however, the believer is the temple. The believer has potential for a personal relationship, fellowship with God through the human spirit and the indwelling Holy Spirit. In the church age, the believer is the priest. All right. Our relationship with God or our spiritual walk, how do they differ between these two periods? Under the age of Israel and the law, there was no universal indwelling of the Holy Spirit by the believing Jew. Some were temporarily endued with power of the Holy Spirit for specific tasks. Thus, the believer met the terms of the law of covenant by human effort alone. The law was entirely a works covenant system. Blessings earned, discipline deserved, and that provided the motivation. The law regulated all behavior, moral, social, and worship. Sins were confessed over a sin offering, which represented Christ, the offering died for sins of the Jew. Having met the terms of the law, the confessing Jew was then declared judicially blameless or righteous under the law. Compliance with the terms of the law covenant was, in effect, the believer's functional spiritual life. Right, how is that different in the church age? The believer is under grace, and he's not under the law. And grace equals from God, undeserved and unearned, very unlike the law. Believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation for life. The spiritual life of the believer is led, enabled, and produced by the indwelling Holy Spirit through faith in that leading and enablement. Thus, the spiritual life is supernatural, not humanly enabled and produced as under the law. Personal sin can damage the fellowship between the believer and God, resulting in chastisement and a paused spiritual life. 
restoration to fellowship is through private confession of sins directly to God. Now, that is the end of our introduction. We get into some serious meat next week, which um, I believe is going to be on Tuesday mornings at 7.30. Is that correct, Dave? That is correct. Okay. All right. Anybody have any thoughts or comments or questions? We have about 15 minutes to go. Hey, Lane, just to make it clear, Tuesday morning next week, we'll have this, and then we'll revert back to Wednesdays from that that's, point on. So, that's, yeah. But we'll send out communications and all that so people know ahead of time. All right, anybody have any um, comments? Uh, I got a question, Lane. Sure. Um, you, uh, with that chart you had up there, which you, one? I want to try to get this out right. You, I want to see if I understood what you said. You, the way God dealt with the Jews in the Old Testament towards sin is different than He deals with sin with us today. Um, the process of finding uh, righteousness was different than than today. God deals with sin the same way. So the process was different. Yeah. We can go directly to God. We're called to boldly approach the throne of Christ. Right. right. The believer in the Old Testament, in um, Israel specifically in this chart, he had to go take a sin offering to the temple. That's, that offering was sacrificed. And while he on, on, the he put his hand upon the head of the lamb or goat or whatever and confessed his sins. And the understanding was the believer's sins were transferred to that sin offering. We know that is symbolic of our sins being transferred to Christ. So it, it was a picture of what was going to happen at the cross. Right. And that animal was sacrificed, just like Jesus was sacrificed on the cross. And that animal carried his sins away, and the blood of that sacrifice was said to cover the sins that God would not see in the figurative, of course. But yeah. technically, it's the same, but the process of getting there is different. Did that help? Uh I think, I think, yeah. One question I have is when David wrote that he would sacrifice bulls and goats to you, but he knew it doesn't please you. I take that that he didn't sacrifice for God because he knew, and in, in, in the Old Testament, I've read, I can't tell you where it is, that God didn't like the law. He, he, he gave it, but he didn't like it. And I think David understood and had a relationship with Jesus Christ spiritually. And at that point, he wasn't under the law. And that's, and I've read other things in the Old Testament. I can't tell you where they are. I, I, I believe that you had believers in Jesus when David called Jesus his Lord, and not David, uh, who wrote the Psalm? David. Yeah. We have a David called Jesus his Lord. I don't believe you get to be my Lord and not have a relationship with him. I believe that when uh, uh, Isaiah writes in past tense about Jesus's death, he's not looking forward to it. He was looking at it. He, in the same paragraphs, he wrote present, past tense, present tense, and future tense about Jesus. We deal in time. Jesus was slain in our time at this date, but in God's time, there is no time. And I, I believe that people, it says in here, where you, where you, where you talked about um, sacrificing bulls and goats for the Jews, the Jews accepted people in that believed like them, and their sins were forgiven for the same reason. God was dealing with the Jews, and, and, and I, they were his chosen people for what they did. But in the spirit realm, there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, male or female. 
So I, I don't see where there's no different judgment for Jews. There's no different way of them being south being saved. There's no different punishment for them. I mean, I don't see where I don't think it's a replacement theology. I think it's the same thing. I think when God looks down, he sees believers and unbelievers in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and forever. God is no respecter of persons. He does not look at a Jew like, okay, I'm going to judge you different, or you're going to get to heaven if you don't believe in me, or you have a different way of believing in me. You're going to have a different judgment than me. There is no difference. You believe or you don't believe in the Old I, Testament, New Testament, or Future Testaments. I didn't say there was a difference. Uh, there was only a difference in the way the. Oh, I'm the, sorry, I didn't mean to get uh, excited. I apologize. Go, go ahead, Lane. I'm listening. I said there isn't really a difference. You're right about that. We're, we're both saved the same way on both sides of the cross. The only difference is they look forward to the cross in in the limited understanding that they had the revelation that they had been given. I think they understood it. I think Isaiah understood as good as John the Baptist understood. I think Isaiah had a fantastic and a spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. And I, I that's just what I believe. And I, hey, Lane, I, I'm, you're doing a great job, and I'm glad I'm here. But uh, we have some, some differences in what we believe. Let me now, clarify some of the yeah. things you just said. I said... Um, where is it? As far as the relationship with God goes, I said um, there was some temporary endowment with power of the Holy Spirit for specific tasks. David was clearly one of those persons that was endued with the indwelling Holy Spirit in his life. And David makes that statement in one of the Psalms. When he said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Mm -hmm. So you are absolutely right. David had a different kind of relationship than the other Jews in Israel at that time because he had, he was endued with the power of the Holy Spirit, much like we have today. Slight difference. In David's case, it wasn't per permanent because he played, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. It was a temporary um, endowment for to empower David to do all of the many things David was being called to do by God. So yeah, you're absolutely right about that. The regular normal Jew, believing Jew, he looked forward to the cross in the sense that, and this is, pay attention to where I'm, where I'm phrasing this. There was a coming Messiah and a coming kingdom. And now you, we have to go back and define just what they saw, they, the way they viewed that. The coming Messiah was going to bring righteousness to Israel and the world. And the kingdom was going to be this period of righteousness. And there's great details on that in Jeremiah, for example. So, yes. They saw the same thing we're seeing or we're looking forward to as in the future, but they just used different terms. And okay. they did not, even though Isaiah 53 clearly pictures Christ in the cross, they didn't really see that in with the clarity that they should have seen that. Otherwise, they would not have rejected him. So it was yeah. a apostasy in Israel at the time. Let me ask you something, Lane. This, this is a, a little, you know, we always said and I always thought, well, the Jews rejected Christ. Uh, well, uh, uh, there were a lot of Jews that didn't reject him. The right. first Christians were right. Jews. And I think that is something that we need to uh, kind of make clear that, I mean, <laughs> yeah, the, the religious leaders rejected him. Uh, but the average, the, the people that he went to, a lot of them didn't reject him. All right. You're yeah. confusing the, the individual with the nation. God was dealing with the nation primarily during the age of Israel. He was calling out a people for his own. In the nation Israel, there were some who were believers, but the vast majority of Israel, yeah. Israelites were not. Yeah. They may have gone through the motions at the temple. Yeah. They were nominal believers. 
So yeah, and I think yeah, I think just Dennis, I think you're you're probably taking stuff and you're looking at it in a in a in a different broad sense because I, I never got at all that there's really any difference except one's looking forward and one's looking back. That was the only difference that that I think was ever brought up. So I, I agree with that. Yeah. I also agree with the in, in dwelling of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, Isaiah knew Christ. Well, yes, he did, because he had the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, Psalms 22 is clearly, you know, David knew what was going to happen on the cross. If you read Psalms 22, it'll blow you away because it was so clearly defined. So, yes, the Holy Spirit was there in our prophets uh, all throughout the Old Testament. But as Lane said, it was indwelling, the temporary indwelling, indwelling, in order for them to write the scripture. All scripture is God-breathed. What does that mean? All scripture comes from the Holy Spirit, inspiring man to write it. And so the Holy Spirit is in every word of the Old Testament, just like it's in every word of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's any changing there or difference yeah. there. It's just what he's defining, and I, I, I tend to agree, is the Old Testament believer didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It was temporary, whereas the New Testament believer, the church age believer, has the Holy Spirit indwelled in them once they accept Christ. And so that's the, that's the biggest difference, I think, is what is all he's talking about, right, Lane? I feel yeah. cool in saying that every author in the Old Testament, every writer, every uh, Moses, um, the uh, prophets, they were all indwelt by the Holy Spirit on a temporary basis to fulfill their ministry. So Isaiah, yes, definitely. He was speaking in the power and, uh, and leading of the Holy Spirit. A question okay. that's kind of changing the topic and I, I just would like you to run through this for me again um, because this is kind of a new thought process for me if all sin is judged at the cross that's what he said so um at the bema seat i have accepted christ as my savior i'm not going to be judged for any sin in my life i'm going to be judged for my spiritual law i understand that what i don't understand is someone who hasn't accepted christ they're not believers I think you said their sins are not going to be judged at the cross. So are they only judged for the lack of a spiritual life? That's, could you, or is that later on in the study? Okay, let me, no, let me, I'll see if I can clarify that. Because there yeah, seems to be a lot of confusion about this. Number one, and this is the most important, important basic point, and everything else stems off of this. All sins were judged at the cross believer and unbeliever alike the sins of the entire world every single person ever walked the face of the earth sins were judged with the cross now we are born as i've stated in a previous lesson we we're born condemned on the basis of adam's sin and then we heap on top of that all of our own personal sin so by the time you're i don't know 20 years old you've got maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of sins on your soul <laughs> Um, that we are under condemnation and then the only way to break out of that is by faith in Christ in that Christ was judged for our sins in our place and we put our trust and faith in that so that's a relief from condemnation we'll look at that a little bit more detail later um, for the unbeliever who doesn't make that decision, he remains in that condemned state, condemned on the basis of his sins. Now, as far as the believer's final judgment, all believers, I'm sorry, all unbelievers are judged at the white throne judgment. The only people that are going to be standing there at the white throne judgment, at, which is at the end of the millennium, on the unbelievers. And it's also called the judgment of the wicked dead. And they will not be judged for their sins. <laughs> They're going to be, it's going to be looked, the, the book of life will be open and their name will not be found in the book of life because it was blotted out because at death they had failed to 
accept the, the provisions that Christ had made for them to go and be in eternity with God. They had rejected that. So the book of life is open. Their name's not in it. The book of life is closed, put aside. We open the book of works. Now that works term gets everybody all kind of messed up, I think. And I, I really hate the term, but there isn't a good one to replace it. What is evaluated for them is how does their righteousness compare to the righteousness of Christ? Because it takes the possession of the righteousness of Christ in order to get into heaven. And we, as believers, were given the righteousness of Christ at salvation. We'll look at that a little bit later on in the study, too. And they will be found not to have the righteousness of Christ, but only their own righteousness, which is minus R, compared to plus R, which is God's perfect righteousness. And, well, sorry, you didn't make the grade, lake of fire. Now, did that kind of clear that up a little bit? Yeah, I think the only question, and we probably don't need to get into that now, is... Those who never had an opportunity to know Christ, uh, they die as an unbeliever. You know, let's say they're in a remote area of Brazil and have never been exposed to the Bible, but they live a righteous life. I reject the concept. Yeah, you reject, reject that concept. I reject. I'm, I'm asking the question. I don't. I don't know what the answer is. All right. Well, I'm, I'm telling. You, I, re I reject that idea, and here's why. I happen to believe that God is perfectly capable of getting the the, the gospel to whomever will show positive volition towards it. I don't care where they're located. I don't. I don't limit God in that capacity. Now, are there people who maybe never received the gospel? And maybe they never received it because they had, they would never demonstrate any positive volition towards the gospel. So I can't prove that one, but that's my supposition. No, but that's you're saying, Elaine, Elaine, to support that, I believe God has all the facts to your point. He's omniscient and, and he's perfect justice. So I don't believe anybody's going to be shortchanged in this process. I don't either. In any way, shape or form as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I tend to agree with that. I'm asking the question is, I gave that example, but what about a five-year-old kid that never understood or a four-year-old kid? And there's a provisional thing that I think God has for that. Uh, there is. There is. Okay. And so that was what I was trying to get across. Yeah. That does not apply to someone of age or only, I mean, that was the question I was trying to ask. Um, yes, there is a provision for that. And that's called the um, age of accountability. You're not held accountable for your decision until you reach a point, if ever, of being able to make a positive de uh, decision for Christ. Being able to understand the gospel and being able, be able, being able to make a positive decision for Christ. That's called accountability or the age of accountability. We're born condemned. You can't be saved unless you're already condemned for something. So children, yes, they have not yet reached the age of accountability and God has to give them a pass on that because they can't make that decision. Same way with someone who say is, it has some mental deficiency or incapacity or uh, brain damage, and they are mentally unable to make that decision. Um, under the law of accountability, those people go to heaven because they were born condemned and God never had an opportunity to uh, make a positive decision uh, decision for the gospel, they are, in effect, I hate to use the term given a pass, but that's what it amounts to. Dave, Dave, the same, the same question you just had could be applied to aborted babies. Correct. I agree. Totally. Jesus loved little children mm -hmm. and he called them to come. They, little children are more susceptible to faith than adults. And that's why it's so important to teach them while they're young. Yeah, particularly before they get to college. Well, particularly then. 
<laughs> Don't send them to college. <laughs> but you know, everybody has creation and conscience throughout their life. Right. And I think you, you judge based upon how you respond to the light that you have. Some yeah. people have very, very dim light. Some people have very bright light, like in America. We have no excuse. Other people live and never hear about Jesus, but they're creation and conscious. How do you respond to that? I think determines your eternity. Let me give you an example of exactly what you're saying, Barrett. I'm, I'm assuming this little story is true because of the source. Um, but the story I once heard was there were missionaries and they encountered a native group. I think this was in the Pacific somewhere, the South Pacific, somewhere around Australia and Indonesia, whatever. And they en encountered an, uh, a, a group on this island who had never had any exposure to outside people. And these missionaries began preaching the gospel. And supposedly the village chief or whatever stopped them. He says, stop. We know this, but we don't know his name. What's his name? Wow. Uh, I've been speaking to these people, like Barry said, through the revelation of the world around them. Or what? But apparently, they had had some encounter with God somehow, but they didn't know his name. Every culture has some degree of the Ten Commandments. Maybe not all 10, maybe not perfectly to, but to a large extent, they, they have that. And I, I think that's part of conscience. Uh, what about, you know, I, I, for some reason, that keeps popping into my head when God in the Old Testament commanded them to go in and destroy and kill everyone, men, women, children. Y'all know the thing. Uh, you know, I often wondered about those children. And sometimes I would think that, well, maybe they're of, I don't know how to say this is not going to come out right, but God knew their future and that there was nothing ever going to come out of those people. Good. It was all going to be evil forever, but maybe he, that was his way of saving the children. That's a question. That's not a statement. I think that's a pretty good, I think you've answered your statement really. Yeah. But I think you're right. You know, I, I think those children are in heaven and yes, um, God does call for discipline of nations who are so antagonistic towards him and towards his people. In this particular case you were talking about, Dennis, that was uh, God's uh, establishing some level of protection for the nation Israel that he was trying to set up. And I think those principles still apply today. And that's why I'm very concerned about the United States. Because I think we've slipped in to, we're not a God-fearing nation anymore like we used to be, like we were created. Yes, we were flawed, but we worked on our flaws and we were developing solutions to our flaws. But unfortunately, we are walking away from God. And like I said last night, the moment we walk away from Israel, that's going to be the end of it. Yeah, and I think the thing to keep in mind too, Dennis, is those were difficult passages when you read that, but God had a plan why he told them that. Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed everything. But look, I'm you not say, questioning well, God. <laughs> yeah, but you look at what he did at the flood. Mm. There was no, no righteousness here except Noah. So it was every woman and child, man, everything was taken out. So when he sees that in a culture, like Lane says, what he does, sometimes we can't justify, but he's sovereign. He knows what he's doing. I read I an don't article. Question. I read an article about 30 years at least. I can't find it. I don't have a copy of it. It was not a Christian article. It was like Wall Street Journal, something like that. Not a scientific journal by any means. But they said that the Jews actually saved the human race. There was such disease in the Canaanites that if it had been left to themselves, it would have spread kind of like the virus we're encountering today and, and it would have destroyed everyone. I can't find that article, but I remember reading it years ago. Interesting. 
So sometimes God has to take people out because it's irreversible and it'll, it'll be too destructive. That's a good point. That's his decision. <laughs> Question. The flood, the flood <laughs> is that way as well. And Sodom and Gomorrah, same way. He, he didn't just arbitrarily pick them as an example. He just said, you got to go because you're going beyond your limit. Well, he did it with the, with the Israelites. I mean, he, yes, he did. the earth opened up. I mean, he. And he would do it with America as well. Yeah. We're gonna. It, it, it's it's bad. They're openly mocking Christians now. Yes. And if you go back to the early parts of television, if if somebody just said something a little out of whack, they weren't on TV anymore. A little, you know. Now it's like you're the dummy if you believe in your imaginary friend in the sky, and that's a term that they're using. Hmm. But there is a solution to that. Jesus gave it. Go and make disciples. <laughs> If these people were Christians, they would not be att attacking Christianity. We have failed as well. Oh. Yeah. Next Tuesday, 730, not Wednesday. And then we go back to our regular schedule the week after. That's All correct. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Father, for this time that you've given us together to fellowship and explore your word. We ask that your spirit... Uh, bring these things to mind that we've seen this week, that uh, we might meditate on them, meditate on your word, and that uh, we might be witnesses for you in Satan's world. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 For an excellent study. Very good. Thanks, everyone. Good night, it's wonderful. Good Thank good you. Good, night. good night. Good job, Lane. Bye, y'all.